Good morning and welcome to Monday. I'm Joe Jaquin, CEO of the Patriot Trading Group, and our toll-free number, 800 951 I I hope you all had a, a good weekend out there. It has been hot hot and hotter here in the valley of the sun uh, not going to let up another hot week in store i guess a little cooler it's only going to be like 114 degrees every day last week i know we broke records i think july was the hottest month on record here in the valley of the sun i know uh, i'm ready for it to be over unfortunately you know we only got a couple more months of this before we get to brag about the weather here in arizona um, just a, a quick update on Eric. Uh, it's it's not going well. Uh, continue to keep him uh, in your thoughts and in your prayers. Uh, we're holding out for a miracle here. Fingers crossed. Um, and as I know more, I will relay it to you. Uh, a lot of things. I'm solo today. The professor is going to join me. Glenn Biddle will join me Tuesday and Wednesday this week. Uh, but it's just me this morning. And uh, I got to tell you, a lot of things happening in in the marketplace we've had a record number of contracts taking physical delivery out of new york uh, we'll talk about that over a hundred metric tons a hundred million ounces of the august contract to be delivered uh, out of the uh, out of the banks or the i guess the vaults if you will of the of the comex uh, into physical hands. You think about it. You no, know, the mint. It's not the mint, right? The mint is, is you know, even the mint on a, a year where they didn't have a problem. They don't sell a hundred million ounces of gold eagles. Not even close, right? They may order a million. You know, uh, it, it, it's not. You know, it's not refiners, right? You know, the 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 guys that make, I, I guess, uh, the gold rounds are they're actually out there. I mean, th- th- that's a little tiny fraction i mean this is either major mega banks or obviously what the billionaires right and and you can you can draw your own it could be i guess it could be hedge funds uh i don't think the pensions the pensions the pensions should do it they don't but they should uh but we'll see if if we get details on that but uh very interesting this is a record by a large margin uh, never have we seen, you know, when you're talking about 100 metric tons of physical delivery uh, in, in a single month out of, uh, out of whether it be London, New York, Shanghai, that's, that's just such a, a, a big amount. Uh, ETF holdings are at all-time record highs. Uh, Fitch, so the, we have three major rating agencies. Now, we can argue and debate whether these rating agencies are, are worth, uh, you know, the the paper that they print things on. You know, and I just point to, like, the, the financial crisis, uh, the dot-com crash, all these crashes. You know, where were the rating agencies warning everybody? Uh, but uh, the three, we have S&P, Moody's, and Fitch. These are the three. They're the, the three majors. Uh, And when it comes to rating agencies, nothing else matters. Fitch, over the weekend, and really it was, I want to say it was Friday, came out and and they said that they have put the United States on on credit watch negative. And this is, this has to do with the triple A rating of the United States And Fitch is now warning, and this is how this works. Here's how the rating agencies work. Before they downgrade you, they give you the warning. Hey, better knock it off, right? We're we're watching you, and I'm telling you, you keep doing what you're doing, and a downgrade is going to follow next. So on Friday... They said that the United States worsening public finance. Listen, we already know. They're never paying the debt. This isn't what the war. This isn't about us paying off the debt. Now, that would be, if it was, let's face it, we'd be, we'd be junk. We're not paying off $27 trillion. And let's face it, we still got another five months before the end of the year, four months for the end of the year. And, and that's going to be 
another, what, two, three trillion. Right? We know. We're not paying it off. No, this has to do with the ability to service the debt you already have. And this is where the Warren and Fitz revised its outlook on the country's credit score to negative from stable, citing a deterioration in the U.S. public finances and the absence of a credible fiscal consolidation plan. And I like the words they used. The absence of a credible, right? In other words, hey, you saying it's not a problem doesn't make us feel any better. Fiscal consolidation plan. In other words, we see no credible plan that you have put forth that leads us to believe that you can control the increase in the amount of debt that you're currently sustaining. Higher, fis higher fiscal deficits and debts were already on a rising medium-term path before the onset of the huge economic shock. Fitz said they have started to erode the traditional credit strength of the United States. Mm. Remember we keep talking about the dollar? Well, it's a funny thing. Uh, we'll talk about that next. Funny thing. Well, I guess it's not a funny thing, but very interesting on, on the weekend of a downgrade. What's going on with the dollar? We'll talk about that next. 800-951-0592. Patriot Radio News Hour. And, and, you know, we're talking about the rating agencies. And, and again, they don't talk about the ability to pay off, right, to get rid of the debt, bring the debt to zero. Uh, you know, Andrew Jackson, right? Well, they're not talking to Andrew Jackson. They're going to pay off all the U.S. debt. I'm not talking about that. They're just talking about the United States' ability to continue to borrow, right? We know every day. Matter of fact, in the morning and the afternoon, right? We, we, we can't do it once a day. No, we got to do it twice a day, every day, right? We've got to sell billions and billions and really tens of billions of dollars every session, every, every bond auction. And we got to do this twice a day to the tune of, of hundreds of billions of dollars a day. We've got to borrow. Got to borrow. Hundred billion dollars a day every day, and and some days it's it's you know two hundred billion. It just depends on the day. And, and we and and now Fitch is saying, hey, you know what? We see the spike. Matter of fact, according to Fitch, we'll reach a hundred and thirty percent of GDP by next year. In other words, the if. If the economy was twenty trillion, right? Fitch says the debt will be a hundred and thirty percent greater than that, and of course we're already there. I mean, I think right now, uh, and, and let me just uh, matter of fact, I know where to look. So I want to say, and it's kind of funny how far behind the agencies really are. But let me give you the exact number right now. As I, yeah, right now, we're at 136%. So I don't know where their 130 is coming from. We just had, well, my guess is they're not counting the negative 33% GDP from last quarter. So let, let's just say that according to Fitch, it's at 130% of GDP. They don't see a credible plan that this number is going to come down after the crisis passes. And this is kind of what I've been telling you. Right? I know that right now, oh, well, it's the crisis. And, you know, we got to spend, spend, spend. Of course, the government says we got to spend because we shut it all down. Fitch now says, hey, we're looking at this unemployment. And we kind of agree with that idiot in Arizona with the microphone saying, hey, unemployment rate. I don't care what, how you want to spin it. You want to say it's 10%, right? We know it's 20%. I don't know how it's going to go lower. So they've got us on Credit Watch negative. S&P, those of you already know, S&P 
lowered our AAA rating to double A plus back in 2011. Now, remember, they got punished for it, right? We know that. They've kept it there. If Fitch joins them, which it appears like they're going to, the majority of the rating agencies will have the United States no longer as a triple A nation. Now, normally, when your credit deteriorates, the ability to borrow money becomes more difficult, and you have to pay a higher rate. Of course, that's unless your central banks are backing you up, so that, that that's a little bit off, but if it keeps deteriorating, that's what happens, right? When you look at Italy or Spain or, or Ireland, you know, Greece, right? they can't borrow at the rate that everybody else borrows at. Like, a lot of Europe's negative, right? Italy isn't, right? You, you, you've you got to pay more as your credit rating deteriorates. Uh, Moody's uh, hasn't commented yet. They're, 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 they have the United States at AAA, but they're the last ones. And my guess is we're going to hear from them very soon because start looking around. You know, and it really makes a lot of sense, right? We've been talking about, especially over the last three or four years, why is all of these countries buying gold? Right? I mean, we... We know China's buying it, Russia's buying it, and, of course, Russia's buying it for different reasons, right? Turkey's buying for different reasons, right? If you want to avoid U.S. sanctions, right, a lot of countries go and buy gold. But what about all the rest of them, right? Why is Austria and Poland and, and all the other countries out there, why are they all buying gold? Why is it that countries like Germany, as an example, the Netherlands, why are they bringing their gold home? And now the picture is starting to get a lot clearer, isn't it? You're seeing a lot of people warning about the reserve status of the U.S. dollar. Last week, we told you about the Chinese and cross-border trade. A lot more countries now very receptive to having the renminbi or the yuan, right, the Chinese currency, instead of the dollar. Why? Because they're like, wait, listen, we want to hold less dollars. And, and, and now uh, all of this is coming you know, into picture here a lot more clearly. Then you look at what happened with the COMEX on August deliveries, a record 100 metric tons of gold being declared for physical delivery. That's so far above what normally would happen in a normal month. I mean, your normal month, it may be 10 million ounces, not 100 million ounces. I mean, this is a huge increase. And the only thing that you start to think about, right, is, okay, the really big money sees something that, People don't want to talk about, you know, the Dow's up, listen to this, the Dow's up over 200 points this morning on a warning from Fitch that our credit is going to be downgraded again. The dollar, which on Friday, remember we talked about it Friday, the dollar broke down Friday below that 92.80. It rallied back, you know, and this is what happens while you think about gold, right? Every time gold gets to 2,000, right, there's a a, a little bit of a sell-off. The dollar bounced off of that closed above 93 on Friday, almost got up to 94 today before coming back down. It's back at 93.60. It's up about a couple of basis points, 93.60 this morning. And, and of course, you're you're like, wait a minute. They just told us that, hey, the dollar is in question and it's a rally, but it's a rally. It's a computer rally. This happens a lot. When you break first break resistance, they try to, you know, you call it the dead cat bounce, so to speak. The dollar has fallen over 10% just this year. It hit uh, a high in March and and has been falling ever since. They said the, the sell-off is coming during the New York trading hours. 
So they're saying, hey, this isn't happening when New York is closed. This isn't happening, you know, in the aftermarkets. This isn't happening in the Asian or the European markets. This is happening while New York is open, suggesting that domestic investors are closing out bets on the strength of the U.S. dollar and his renewed questions about the supremacy of the dollar. Matter of fact, July, one of the worst months ever for the dollar. And, and they're saying that uh, people are waiting for good news about the virus. And, of course, again, that's a false hope because you got to understand the, the where we're at with the virus is we're already going to have another round of stimulus. This week, still no agreement. Uh, that means unemployment checks now are going to be only what the state offers. We'll see about evictions. We're going to have to watch that. And how all of this is going to play out, we have 20% of the country not working. How do we get it back? Is anybody going to jump on an airplane in the next 30, 60, 90 days if they don't have to? Right? Is anybody right? Well, you can't go on a cruise ship, right? You know, you're not, you're, you know, and again, all these states, I think I saw New York said they're going to allow outdoor eating next year, right? And I mean, you know, you start thinking about what the ramifications of all of these are, and I think Fitch has it right. Fitch is saying, hey, listen, we don't see, even after the virus, any credible plan on how this is all going to work. Now, we've talked a lot, too, about what? The shrinking middle class. Right? We've been talking a lot about, especially now, it looks like it's happening again. And you think about all the crashes we had. You go back to 87. We lost a lot of middle class. The tech bubble. We lost a lot of the middle class. The financial crisis. We lost a, a lot of the middle class. And now here we are back again and, and call it the corona bubble or the corona crisis. Right, We're losing a lot of the middle class. Some interesting data has come out about homes. And they're talking about how old people are that own a home in 1981 so you go back to the year that we first hit a trillion dollars of debt was 1981 and now here we are 27 26 trillion dollars later the median age of a home buyer okay so you're buying you're in the market to buy a home in 1981, you take the oldest person buying a home, you take the youngest person buying a home, the second oldest, the second youngest, third, boom, 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 to get to the guy that's right in the middle. Half, half the people buying a home are older than this person. The other half are younger. The age was 31, right? I think about, you know, my wife and I, right? I was, uh, I think I was... Honey, how old was I when we bought our first home? Was I 29? 29? So I was, you know, right right around there. You know, a little bit on the younger side. I was 29 when we bought our first home. They said today, the median age, in other words, half the people are younger than this age, half the people are older, is now 47. All of a sudden, many of the new home buyers are no longer, right, the millennials, they're not buying homes. Because, you know, well, let's face it, they can't afford them. And now they're saying the median age of a person buying a home in the United States is 47 years old. And this is the problem. You know, when we look at home prices, home prices are great if you own one. But all the other, all the other data on homes, not so good. 
right? Of course, we're nowhere near where we used to be in home sales. We've kind of settled into this, like, 5 million home range uh, for existing homes because uh, that's the 90% of the market, about 5 million. You know, you go back to, to 2000, the number was 7 to 8 million homes a year. We're at 5. And then you think about homes for sale, right? There's not there's not a lot of inventory out there. There's not a lot of 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 homes to buy out there and the answer to me is pretty simple. The home buyers see this data, they know, hey, not that many people can afford to buy a home. And right on top of that, the government over the weekend said, "Hey, we may be misleading people." And the number of people actually owning the homes that they're buying. We'll talk about that one next. Patriot Radio News Hour. We'll be back after the break. This is the Phyllis Schlafly Report, a daily commentary continuing the conservative pro family legacy of Phyllis Schlafly. Now, the president of Phyllis Schlafly Eagles, Ed Martin. For months now, law-abiding Americans submitted to the demands of so-called experts to maintain a six-foot distance from friends and family. This meant familiar gathering places like restaurants, hotels, and even sports arenas had to close and remain closed indefinitely, causing economic hardship for millions. When a few hundred law-abiding citizens, some lawfully carrying their personal weapons, marched in front of the Michigan State Capitol to protest the nation's most extreme stay-at-home order, liberals feigned outrage. The so-called mask police demanded that all Americans don intrusive face coverings in public. The U.S. House of Representatives even switched to proxy voting despite its unconstitutionality. Leftists marching under the banner of never let a good crisis go to waste tried to use a perceived national crisis to advance their political agenda. With law-abiding citizens stuck at home under lockdown orders from Democratic governors, the lawless seized the streets. Mobs of thousands of militants armed with crowbars, fire starters, and other dangerous weapons rampaged through the darkened streets. They roamed lawlessly in search of soft targets to loot, burn, and pillage in the name of racial equality. This kind of violent chaos can happen only in the absence of an armed citizenry. Merchants ought to be able to defend their shops with their own lawful firearms, but liberal gun control policies turned our streets into a might-makes-right Wild West showdown. When a black professional basketball player saw his truck being vandalized by a protester in his residential neighborhood, the 6-foot-6-inch, 225-pound athlete rushed out and beat back the vandal. But we're not all as strong as giants who play in the NBA, and many of us rely on local police, sheriffs, and mayors to protect our private property against lawlessness. The state governor, state police, and National Guard should be called in as needed to restore order. In the end, it all comes down to this one question. When your local politician looks out the window and notices violent looters in the street, do they see criminals or do they see a voting block to pander to? That's the standard to judge candidates by in November's election. This has been the Phyllis Schlafly Report from Phyllis Schlafly Eagles. As President Trump fulfills his campaign promises, his accomplishments on trade, immigration, the economy, and protecting the unborn should be celebrated, not ignored or diminished. To track these victories, go to phyllisschlafly.com and find out what's next for the Trump presidency at phyllisschlafly.com. Thanks for listening to the Phyllis Schlafly Report. 800 951 Patriot Radio News Hour. We got gold all over the place. Uh, well, again, we have different markets, different exchanges. Uh, right now uh, in New York, gold's higher. Uh, in London, gold's lower. Uh, but the bottom line, gold's at 1970 and, and change. Silver, same thing. In New York, gold, silver's higher. Uh, in London, silver's lower, uh, $24.40 on silver uh, on a Monday. Remember, this is jobs week this week. So we'll get Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Uh, of course, Friday being the big number, the government's jobs data number, that, that's going to be an important number uh, to look out for. So we'll pay attention to that. Uh, but before the break, we're talking about homes and the buyers. Now, think about the, the buyer of a home now. It's almost 50 years old. 
takes that long. Right? It takes that long to be able to afford to buy one. And really, usually at 50, you're doing what? Right? You're, you're either moving up, right, buying a better house, or, or you're moving down, right, you're, or you're downsized, depending on how early you had kids, right? You can be uh, upsizing or downsizing. You're, you should be at least on your second, maybe your third home, right, you know, because you move. But it's very clear affordability has become a problem. And think about what does it mean to be middle class? Right? Middle class used to be, hey, you know what? I own my home, right? I, I'm a home buyer. Uh, I've got the yard. I've got the, the two kids. i got the white picket fence. i got a couple cars. Uh, and and, and that, that is slipping away. And, and I, I don't know very many millennials at all that own their home. I've told you a bunch of stories about my friends. Their kids are a little older than mine. The ones that have one, it's because their parents helped them. They couldn't actually afford it. And most of them, hey, I could afford the payment. I can't afford the down payment, right? I can afford, you know, this amount, but I can't afford the 20% down. And then the government over the weekend said, hey, you know what? The home ownership rates, we've overstated them. So before the corona, and I've noticed this, ever since March, the government's home ownership rates have been going up. You know, we, we were at 60%, right? 60% of people own their home. For, we were a 60-40 own versus rent, right? That just tells you how big the middle class has shrunk. But since March, that 60 number's been rising. I think we're like, like at 62, which is a big move, you know. Doesn't sound like a lot, but it is. Well, the government came out and said, well, that's not accurate because what was happening is before the coronavirus, the government would go out to X amount of homes every month. So in other words, hey, this, this home just got bought. A month later, someone from the government, and I don't know if they called or physically, sounds like, according to the government, they were physically knocking off the door. And then asking the person who answered it, do you own this home or are you renting it? Because what, what they found out is, the paperwork wouldn't, uh, didn't, you know, usually you, you're supposed to tell them, oh, this is a rental property, this is an investment property, or I'm buying it to actually live in it. And what the government found out was, yeah, people lie. And so they'd go door to door and ask, and they, and they would just extrapolate, right? Okay, well, we went to a 1,000 of them. The percentage was, you know, hey, we were off 2 or 3%, and they would make that adjustment. During Corona, they don't go to the door anymore. They stop doing that because of coronavirus. But instead, now I think the solution is simple. Well, take what you were averaging, right? You've been allegedly doing this for decades. There's got to be an average. Hey, if I, an average, uh, usually, you know, two, three, four, five percent, whatever the number was, actually weren't buying the home to live in. They were buying it to rent. And make the adjustment. Well, that's that's too much common sense. The government's just said, ah, we're not making any adjustments at all. And then, of course, over the weekend, they just said, hey, just don't believe the number we give you. Right? There you go. Problem solved. So my guess is, based on that data, right, we, we've got a problem. And I think it, it's just another one of the data points uh, when we look at the the United States and you start thinking about it doesn't happen overnight. None of this happens overnight, right? This, this, this takes time, it takes sometimes decades. And what we've seen really is, and I know since 2000, we've seen a, a decline in the United States. And the data, at least on housing, says, hey, go back to 1981. And we've seen this subtle, gradual decline. And you start thinking about, 
all the rioting and, and, and all of all of the chaos and the and the country, you know, we're so divided now. And it's be, because of this gradual, you don't see it, it doesn't punch you in the face. It, well, I guess it does during a crisis, right? It, it, it reared its head during dot com. It reared its head during the financial crisis. It's rearing its head again during the COVID crisis. But it's there. And it's happening. And, it, and it's happening uh, at a faster rate. And it's happening more often than we want to admit. But this is just what, what we're seeing. You know, when you look at uh, layoffs today, uh, Lord & Taylor, the oldest retail stores in the United States, filed for bankruptcy. Men's Warehouse filed for bankruptcy. Caterpillar. North American sales crashed by the most since the financial crisis in the second quarter, right? And you you just start putting all of these things together, and you're like, uh, uh, Noble, uh, they're a a huge little conglomerate uh, that owns a a bunch of different retailers and said, hey, we're filing uh, for for bankruptcy protection. And then the World Health Organization, uh, for whatever credibility they have, they came out and said, and they've been saying what I've been saying, I don't know about this quote-unquote vaccine, right? I don't know that there's going to be, hey, take this one shot, kind of like polio or the mumps or the measles. Hey, you take this shot, you're good. And by and large, right, 99% of the people are good. There's always, like, I, you know what, I, I'll, I'll use me as an example. I actually got the mumps. I had the vaccine and I still got it. It was, you know, it wasn't a, a huge deal, but but I got them. And I think that that, uh, but again, I, right, I'm still, and I don't, you know, it's not something you talk about. But I didn't know anybody else had had the mumps. But for 99 percent of the people, it works. The World Health Organization saying we're probably looking at something that may help at best 50 percent. It's a radio news hour. We'll be back after the break. 800 uh, More news. This one coming out of China. Now, China, obviously, well behind, I guess that's the best word to use, on the phase one trade deal. Uh, phase two is off. Uh, president said, you know, forget it. And, and rightfully, I mean, what else could he say, right? We can't even get them to do what they promised in phase one. And, of course, I said it from the beginning. It was almost impossible to begin with. And then, or you throw coronavirus on top of it, and and uh, I guess it gives China cup. China was never going to do it. That's the thing. And I almost um, am, am upset because they have coronavirus to give some cover, right? We're dealing with a huge crisis, and right now we don't have a, a lot of time to pay attention to how little they're actually buying. Then last week I told you about cross-border trade. Now, cross-border trade, that means China's buying things from other countries. Other countries are buying things from China. Okay. 70% of cross-border trade in China was done in dollars. That was all the way up what, until what, last year. 70% was done in dollars. It's down to 56%. Right? And you think about 70 to 56, that's a 20% drop. And it's all being done in Chinese currency, in renminbi. We, we talked about that last week. This Fast forward to this week. China has been out warning their, their, uh, their banking and insurance regulatory commission, warning about the U.S. currency, right? And this is part of the pitch, right? China's making pitches when they talk to these countries about, hey, you know, I know that we were buying uh, these components – in 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 dollars, but hey, let's switch it to, to to our currency. And the and the other country on the other end's like, well, gee, I don't know. And they're like, well, you know, let's look at things here. Right now, they can say, hey, Fitch is getting ready to downgrade. Look at all the debt. Look at the you know the United States. They like to bully people. Blah blah blah. You know, they lay out their case, and apparently, it's working. 
Then over the weekend, some interesting things came about when it came to SWIFT. For those of you, and I'm not talking about the trucking company SWIFT. SWIFT is the payment system. A lot of you already know this payment system countries use to, to, buy, to pay things. It's like a clearinghouse, right? So if, if China is buying, you know, I don't know, they're buying oil from Russia. Okay, they're buying oil from Russia, and they're buying, you know, five cargo ships of oil, and it works out to, you know, I don't know, $10 million. They use SWIFT to send the money. Now, maybe Russia's a bad example, but uh, to all these other countries, you know, to Italy, to France, to Germany, to us, right? And all these countries, they use the SWIFT payment system. It's, it's kind of like uh, swiping your credit card here at Patriot, right? You we're using uh, a, a system that you, you swipe the card electronically and boom, the payment arrives. SWIFT does the same thing. According to Reuters, they said that a report from uh, the Bank of China has warned that China should prepare and should start preparing for potential U.S. sanctions, and they should start switching away from the dollar-centric SWIFT system and increasingly use its own financial messaging network for cross-border transactions in the mainland, Hong Kong, and Macau. According to the Bank of China's report, which was co-authored by the former foreign exchange regulator, greater use of the CIPS, that's the Chinese system, and that stands for cross-border, so the C is cross-border, the I, interbank, the P, payment S system, cross-border interbank system, instead of the SWIFT system that would reduce the exposure of China's global payment data to the United States. In other words, it would reduce China's need to hold dollars. And again, this is something that I think the Chinese, again, so it, it, it's, it's a multi-pronged approach that China's using. Number one, Right? They're trying to buy less and less from the United States. Right? It's trying to, whatever they can, can source outside of the U.S., that's what they're trying to do. Number two, right? they're actively out there in cross-border trade, getting other countries to accept something other than dollars. Number three, they've developed their own interbanking system, which remember now, China's got a lot of leverage, right? Countries out there that may be hesitant at some point in the future, and you know this, we all know this, at some point in the future, China's going to force them. Hey, when you deal with us, you use our system. When you deal with the United States, you can do what you want. But we're your largest trading partner, right? We're more important to you than the United States is. I mean, this is what's coming next. And this is why when you sit there and we talk about you got to be your own central bank, you got to realize all of this is happening. We're so focused on what's happening with coronavirus, right? And who's got it, who doesn't have it, how many people are dying, who's not dying, what's closed down, what's open, what's reclosing down, wave one, wave two, wave whatever, we, you know, stimulus three, four, five, right? We're so focused on that. We're missing the little things that are really the big things that are happening globally and the dollar's under attack and I've been telling you that since I've gotten back the dollar's under attack and get ready that next leg down is coming and China's helping it happen Patriot Radio News Hour final segment coming up Eight hundred nine five one zero five nine two Patriot Radio News Hour eight hundred oh wait I just did that didn't I oh oh what we have today so here's what we've got 
We've got five dollar Liberty Gold pieces right at five ninety five. Still have some of those. Ten dollar pieces at eleven forty. That's it on the gold side in, in quantity. If you want twenties, we do have twenties, just not a lot of them, a very small amount of them. Uh, on the silver side, uh, rolls of silver quarters, silver dimes, silver half dollars are, are all available. Uh, right now, uh, the rolls of silver quarters, I'm going to put them on sale today. They're 230 I'm going to put them on sale. I'll put them on sale online as well. Uh, $220 on, on silver quarters. If you buy 25 rolls or more, now 25 rolls is a quarter bag. If you buy 25 rolls, save another five bucks at 215. So uh, a quarter bag of quarters would be five thousand three hundred and seventy-five dollars at eight hundred nine five one zero five nine two. So to repeat that, five dollar liberties on the gold side, five ninety-five. Ten dollar liberties, eleven forty. Right. So obviously your price per ounce on the ten dollar liberty is is smaller but the five dollar liberties right we you know uh get that fractional piece it costs a little more on the silver side i'm putting silver quarters on sale so instead of 230 uh they're 220 a roll right and you get 40 quarters in a roll if you buy 25 rolls or more 215 dollars you can save up to 15 dollars a roll at 800 951 And again, a quick look here at the markets. Uh, just a weird market today uh, as the the pricing in London and New York vastly different. The price is about the same. Uh, right now, uh, uh, Kitco, which is the London price, says it's 1970. Uh, I'll tell you right now, I got gold up a couple of bucks at 1973. Uh, they've got silver at... 2420 and it's down 28 cents in London in New York gold's up 13 cents at 2435 uh, and again we're just gonna I think this is going to continue uh, the price divergence it's not great remember uh, last month we had price divergence of, I think it got up to like 40 or 50 dollars at one point uh, so here they're 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 fairly close a couple of dollars uh, on gold and, and uh, 20 cents or so on silver. And a lot of that having to do with heavy, heavy, heavy demand uh, coming out of New York as a, and I don't know who it is, maybe at the end of the month when the contract expires, they'll let us know who took delivery, but a record 100 metric tons of gold uh, was taken for delivery. In other words, they've already told them, hey, when the contract ends, I want you to physically deliver me the gold. A hundred well, metric tons is 3 million ounces, 3.215 million ounces of gold being delivered to somebody. Hey, maybe it's one of you. 800 951 0592. Radio News Hour. We'll be back tomorrow.